I was in, 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 uh, in England, and it, it was all girls, nurses. They would clean my, the bullet went in bed, underneath my spine, just a millimeter would have knocked the bones out. And this Money bullet shot. came out behind my ear. And there was a big spot behind my ear. And so, like Mike said, they treated me for, I, I think it was not even a week. And then I told him, 82nd Airborne caught me. And I'm glad they didn't shoot me. <laughs> but they did. One guy shot me. But two guys came, I sit behind the hatch this high, and where they came from, behind the road was a hedge almost as high to the windows. So when I said that, she said, you're going to the United States. Fine with me, what would I say? <laughs> and here they had a, a ship ready, and we were put on the bottom of the ship, and believe it or not, it had barbed wires all around us, but on the ship below. And we could only go on top for 10 minutes and then back down. And the, when we took off from up there, the second time we were outside, I looked around, tried to count all the ships around us because the war was still going on. And they told us the submarines in this area, and they had, I counted up to 40 all around our ship, far out. But pretty soon, nothing happened. We landed in the United States, and we got off the boat, and they had a train waiting. We got on the train, it took off, and all of a sudden we were in Maryland. We didn't know where Maryland was, so. But here, there's a whole bunch of guys, short pants, they all talk German. And I thought, boy, that's pretty good. But they were rumbles people from Africa, and they told us they were ready to go back home. And it was our turn to take over. <laughs> so that was it. We were in tents. Our barracks were not done yet, but in a week or two, we moved into brand new barracks, and from then on, they sorted out people from our country they didn't want in our camp, which was SS. They sorted them all out, shipped them someplace else. When it was all done, they put us in, we had uh, so many people in the barrack, and then all of a sudden they said, if anybody of you want to work, Fine. If not, stay home as a prisoner. And they didn't have to say that to loud uh, because the first morning we were asked to come if you want to work. Come to the gate, and here was trucks. And at first, there was a the the guards were all older people. We could tell. And then uh, we got on the truck and they took off to a, a, a packing place or to a farm where you have to cut, or in the orchard where you have to cut stuff off. And so I made the round and got off on, on a farm and nothing but tomatoes. 
and our guard, he disappeared. He probably sat down in a little hedge or whatever. And we had to go across the field. We didn't know what we were doing. We looked at the tomatoes looked pretty red. <laughs> and so this is how we spent our day. When the truck stopped at the farmer, they said, we need four guys off the truck. Sometimes only two got off. Some people didn't want to work on the farm. So that was okay. The two went off and they were going to be picked up at night. And then our truck would go to the next place, which was probably a sawmill. And you sat down in the truck and you don't go over there. No, I better not get off. <laughs> this is, if you think about it, a prisoner, you couldn't do that in our country. If you were told to work, you better work. Because I seen Russian in Germany, they could hardly have anything to eat. And at that time, I was not drafted yet, but I was working on a building. And when I seen that, we were not supposed to talk to them. And I told my mother, I said, you know, have you anything you can give me and I can put it someplace when I go to work. She said, yeah. She made a bag ready. And one of the guys, he talked broken German. And when I showed him the bag, and I pointed where I put it, nobody else could see it. And I did that as long as I worked over there, and that was quite a while till I ended up in the army. So anyhow, we got every day, there was a lot of guys standing on the gate, want to go out to work. And one time, I landed on the Phillips Packing Company in Cambridge, Maryland, just to see what was going on. And it was a big company. They did rations uh, for Army, Navy, Air Force, these packages where they had food in. And boy, that sounded pretty good. Even so, we couldn't complain about food. We had plenty of food in, in our camp. But anyhow, so here the the guards, well, you didn't see him all day till back home. And he had some of the guys kind of overdid it. The empty cans, they didn't, couldn't read it, but was in it. Oh, they didn't want it. So they threw it in the warehouse. There was all cans stacked up. So the can flies in back of it. Till one of the guards seen it, and he comes with a can, and it says Frankfurter on there. Really? Really? Frankfurters? Yeah, he, he, he said the little sausages. Oh, he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> From then on, that was number one can to open because it was good. But then somebody else, by accident, opened a can. Believe it or not, it had cigarettes on top. Now, that became number one. Even so, we could buy cigarettes in a can for 15 cents a pack at those days. Why did it that? I don't know. And at lunchtime, we walked around, and the guy who was in charge of loading wagon, the, the railroad, so far they ended up only two a week. When we took over, we include, we made it to five 
railroad cars a week. So they all liked us and they never complained about nothing. And one day at lunchtime, I was walking around and here's a guy making jewelry. It was a jewel from Germany out of silver dollars. In those days, nobody paid attention to silver dollars. It was a dollar. So the, the jeweler made the silver dollars into rings, but he needed guys to polish them. Well, what can we polish them with? So he told us, find a piece of two by four and just takes long, but they get shiny. Or a leather belt. So that's what we did a lot of times at lunchtime. But all of a sudden somebody come in. Good clothes with a little Dremel. Electric. And from then on, well, I chose something the next time the truck took us out to wherever. One time I was in a, it was in the country, they had two barns, big ones, side by side, and the, the, one of the laborers over there showed me what, where I had to go on top, and a, there was a thing coming from this side, and where I was standing, the sweet corn would come up. It took the, all the, the leaves off till he comes to me, and I had to turn around to go that way. They gave me a, a suit out of uh, plastic, and I thought, boy, I don't need that, till I found out, boy, the stuff stick on me. So I did put that suit on. <laughs> and I did that for a couple of days, and then I found out down, when it came back down, it was all, the corn was clean, and you could eat it. But <laughs> we didn't have sweet corn in Germany. But when they told us you could eat that, they should have never said that. <laughs> <laughs> so we That's had something case. else we could steal and eat. I stayed there for a while, and then the next truck I took out, and I looked at the pass, it passed the sawmill because people got out already from another truck. And I thought, well, that looks pretty good. So the next time, as soon as the guard asked, I need four or five guys, boy, I, I was up, just quick. I wanted to see what's going on. And I met some of the guys in there, and uh, one of the guys, uh, after I was there a couple days, took me into, the office wasn't any bigger than a trailer. And there was two guys, they were in their 80s. And he was talking to them, and I didn't understand a word. So he took me back out, and I did my job, what I had to do. And then all of a sudden, after several weeks, he had asked these two guys if he could take me on his truck to deliver lumber to people. The two owners wouldn't agree to that. He said, the army, you have to ask one of the officers when they come around. Sure enough, that's what he did. Then, when they said, well, you're taking a chance. You take this guy on your truck and go wherever you have to go deliver lumber, yeah. So it took another week till these two old guys who owned the land agreed. 
And so this guy who wanted me on his sock, his name is Aris Rudder, a little bit older than I am, and he never told me that he got the permission. All of a sudden he comes, he said, you come with me now. And uh, he said, I need uh, 10 two by fours or two by sixes or whatever, and then put it on the truck drove forever we had to go. And he had a rifle sitting behind me. He, right away when I got into the truck, he said, that's not for you. <laughs> so, yeah. so, and a lot of times when we for our campus, and he lived in Girdle Tree. There was maybe seven homes. That was the whole town. <laughs> and, you know, he told me that. I hadn't seen it yet. So then he, once in a while, maybe once a month, he had to go into the woods. The, the main sawmill was in the woods where they took trees, big trees, cut it into sizes, yeah. and then they the, like our trucks, they picked up, cut lumber already, filled the truck up, we go back home to the, to the sawmill, unload it, and the guys who were cutting it into smaller pieces, that's what they did. Or we brought some of the lumber to a place where they, what is it, they, they put it in, it's airtight, and when you use that for, well, I carve, wood carving, and that lumber is all dried up in that thing there. So once in a while we have to go there and empty the truck and then come back. So one, now comes a time where we have to go back to the, in the woods. It was quite a ways. Here we took off and all of a sudden, oh, he said I got it. He turned off the highway, stopped the truck. He said, you drive and then I want to shoot crows. I just looked at it. I seen kids in this state when I came, they could all drive, high school kids. They were good all right, not only in Europe. And I just looked at him, he, he got his rifle, he jumped around on the other side, sat by the window, and had it. <laughs> if the crows were there, there was plenty of them. And he, he just did like this, you drive. I tried to tell him in a nice way, I, I never drove. <laughs> I've seen him, but he does with his feet. And then the sticks. No. <laughs> Mine tried to get it started. He never looked. I'm sure he heard the noise. <laughs> but I was sitting there, and finally I had it going real, real low. And then he did like this Watch me. I had to go look out of that window when he was shooting that crow. He never hit one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I drove real slow because I didn't know what a lumber yard was in, in the woods, but I was driving. <laughs> Another time, he had a delivery somewhere in the neighborhood or, and he told me, where it was, but I, I didn't even know. But he said a tower. I don't, I'm a stranger. So here we're driving through the woods, and he's constantly on the wrong side, as if he knew it. Nobody's coming our way. All of a sudden, there was a building there. He pulled over. It's a grocery store. I wasn't supposed to go in anything. 
He said, come on. P-W, 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 and it had people in it. And I, I tried to say something, he didn't even, he didn't understand me and he didn't listen either. He said, come on. Well, I walked in there and everybody, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and then he said, do you ever have cornbread? Cornbread? Nope. He bought a loaf and something else. So we got back into the truck and he put the loaf between us and he opened it up like this and he grabbed a piece. He said, here, try it. <laughs> I, you know what? I said, I, I never had it, and I really don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a flap right there. <laughs> now comes the something. I should have said that in the beginning, but he got the permission to take me. I'm sorry that I screwed it up. All of a sudden, he pulls into Girl Tree. That's when I first see where he lives. Seven homes, grocery store right by him. And he parked in the back by the garage. He got out and he looked around and said, come on. I wasn't supposed to do that. So here, we walk into the kitchen. Here comes his wife with a baby in her arm. And the first thing he said, you got something for him to eat? Oh boy. And she said, peaches, a can of peaches. And then he said to me, you like peaches? He said, you know them with a stone in the side, on the inside? I said, yeah. She brought a big can of peaches, opened it up, and I ate it. And then all of a sudden, he said, oh, this is our little girl, April. I said, that's not a name. <laughs> I said, why'd you name it April? Born in April. Really? When? <laughs> April 17. I said, me too. <laughs> yeah. He said, really? I said, yeah. But I didn't call me April. You know? <laughs> <laughs> From then on, <laughs> He showed me the grocery store, and I took our son there when we came to this country. And the, it's an old time store with a big stove in the middle, and people who are retired, when he took me in there, they were all sitting around the stove and talking. They never paid any attention to me. So he introduced me to the people who own it, and then we walked back out. And one day he said, you know, I, the house next to it is empty. I said, really, do you want to buy it? Oh, guess what they want? Well, two story. He said, five grand. Is that too much? Oh, he said, I'm going to wait till they lower the price. I could have given 5000 at that time <laughs> if I had the money. There was nothing wrong with that house, what I could see. So this is, this is something he did all by himself, never thought about the cops or the, the soldiers. He promised he would watch me 
He took me to his school, Snow Hill is the next town, just a little town. And he, he just walks in, he, he knocks on the office door and walks right back in. And he said, come on. He introduced me to the teacher. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And then I found out he did, the older boys, he taught them how to do the electric. They had a big room, bigger than this, where they had a, a garage built all out of two by four, nothing siding or nothing on. And there I could see what he did. And they had to string the lines and then connect it if <clears> they <throat> could. That's how they learned to be electrician. So, and he did that with, uh, with another store, flower shop. And pretty soon the whole little town of Girl Tree and Snow Hill they knew who I was when he came by with a truck or a wave. I felt like I was at home, really. And when the time came, I found out that we were almost ready to go home. We didn't know the exact time. But they took pictures of us. They had changed our uniform to black and right away some of the people <coughs> called us SS which we were but black shirt black pants and really that meant we were going to go home pretty soon when I found out just about when it was, but he, when I was still by that sawmill, they had taken pictures of us. And I got one in, in the envelope there, our black uniform, and I said, Art, you see this? Oh, he said, yeah. He got into the next room. That room had nothing but rifles on this, on the wall. He collected them, and on the, the little, was a little, I think a radio or whatever, he said, that's where I'm going to put it, and it's going to stay there. <coughs> and I said, well, I hope you do, because I'll be back. He just looked at me like, yeah, yeah, and you know what? We were ready to go back home. That's what our captain, which I got his name, he was kind of a joker. He was a commander of our camp. He comes in in the morning. I worked a little couple days in the kitchen because one guy was from Denmark. They sent him home. They didn't know he was from Denmark. So I, I, Instead of going out, I stayed in the kitchen. Took his job. Here comes that Captain Burkett, and he jumped on the table, and he said, did you ever see somebody do the uh, jitterbuck? <laughs> jitterbuck. <laughs> and then he started dancing up there. <laughs> this is how he was. He married a German girl who came in the late 20s. Mike looked him up on the computer and he was from Indiana. <laughs> but couldn't tell nothing else. So, but you call it a prison of war camp and I'm glad. When you look at our camp and you there was a highway going maybe uh, not even to the car dealership over there I see the cars halfway maybe and the fence to the street the bottom wire just high off the grass all the way you 
you could just sit down and go like this, and you are, you can walk over there and talk to them. <laughs> Nobody stop anybody. You couldn't do that nowhere else. And nobody had an idea to take off because of that. I think they did it on purpose. Just to, we had, we all have work. Some people they had a job inside the camp. They were busy with uh, teaching music or painting, you name it. And I was interested in mandolin. Well, I, should, I shouldn't have said that. Pretty soon, here was a guy, he was a professional. He could play the guitar, mandolin. And all of a sudden, he said, you want to learn? I'll tell somebody, they'll bring you a mandolin. And sure they did. And we were three guys this teacher and another young guy and me. And pretty soon, you know what? We could play the mandolin, maybe two or three items. And he said, don't tell anybody. We're going to surprise the camp that they have a doing. Sure enough, they had their doings. And then all of a sudden, this guy who taught us he stood up and he said, well, I got a surprise for you. Here's two guys and me. We're going to play three songs, what he taught us. And you know what? <laughs> it worked out beautifully. And it, when, we, when we finally got back to the, well, we, well, I said, we have to go home. And sure enough, they meant it. I took that mandolin. Nobody took it off of me. I could take 80 pounds of stuff. That was it. And that was quite a bit. And our ca captain, that jokey one, he said, yep, you've been here long enough. You go home. Now, sure enough, we got up to, first of all, they had to take us to the train. Train took us to the boat. And on the boat, these guys, they didn't even pay attention. We were prisoners. We could walk around where we could And then all of a sudden, we were five days on the ship. And one of the guys called me and said, you know what? I just heard it the, had the uh, connection to different ships. He said, you're going to go back to England. What? Yep, that's what they just said. We're going to stop in Southampton. Really? As soon as we, the boat, sure, Southampton, they stop. We come down there, and they had guys, guards, you know, every four feet on each side. And we kind of, didn't even pay attention. First of all, he had the, uh, the bad suit on, black. And then when we got down, they took us to a camp. And then they wanted to send us to work. Nobody went to work. We just told them, you do it yourself. <laughs> they were they were that bad. And you know what? They could not do anything to us. They left us alone till finally somebody must have said, Well, you know, we gotta do something. So they moved us from this camp to a different camp. And it was a big camp. And the first thing they said, now, you brought a lot of stuff along. There's some guys here. You have to split it with them. Well, but believe it or not, I met somebody who was working when he was in, 
in Germany. He knew my dad. I said, really? I said, you need anything? <coughs> yeah, I, he took some of the stuff. And, but then, we didn't stay there. They brought us to another one in Wales. And all of a sudden, we were told, if you want to work, there's bicycles, each one gets a bicycle. And here comes a, a farmer to the camp and he wanted two for his farm, one who could paint a regular painter, and a bricklayer. <laughs> uh, he didn't say bricklayer, but who knows how to do that kind of stuff. And the first day they showed us where it is. From then on, each one took a bicycle, drove to his farm. Nobody cared. Soon as we come to the farm, that he accepted us. And the first thing is five cigarettes, a pack, each one. And he had a nice, nice building there. And he told the, uh, the, the painter if he could do the doors inside. The doors were painted black. And this was a, the painter was a real good painter. And for me, we stood in front of the house. And he said, you know, I never got sills underneath the windows. Can you put cement under there? I said, sure. If you got a ladder, yeah. And he said, I want a flower box all the way in front of the building. I said, can you get what I tell you now? I figured out how many block. I said, what do you want to do on top? Why? I said, you gotta have something on top, either brick or a block. Yeah, he said, I can get them. They're round, and those were brick. And then, as we got to know each other a little better, he said, you know what? You probably think all these lords own all what you see. He said, I don't need them. I own whatever I have. That was a pretty nice. And you know, from then on, every morning when we came, tea time, we didn't even get to work yet. But I seen that painter, and the, this guy's uh, mother was still living. When he showed us the door, she stood there and did like this because he put uh, five coats on that door, but not black. They were kind of a little yellow or like that. They couldn't believe it. You could stand in front of the door, you could see yourself. And boy, they liked that kind of thing. And the same with, with what I did. That's what I learned. And he got me everything I needed. And the same, these guys who worked in the field there, he didn't even go and look at them because they knew what they were doing. They were raised on a farm. So pretty soon, we were notified that we were going to be sent home. And I thought, well, in the meantime, I had a bad toothache. And I reported that to the, if I didn't, if, if you're sick, you're not going to be released. That was the, so I thought, well, I try it. And they looked at me and at my, this was all swollen up a little bit. And uh, no problem. And they got a guy 
and me. And he said, you go with him, he takes you to the desert. And we were walking. Pretty soon, there was a bus station. He took me on a bus, drove for maybe another 10 minutes, and there was the dentist in a trailer alongside the road. And I thought, oh my goodness. But when I walked in there, he looked at me. Oh, he said, that's got to come out. I said, yeah. So he did his job. Boy, was I surprised. He did, didn't take it nothing. And by the time we got home, you know, I could feel the swelling is gone. And honest to goodness, I would have never come home with them. When they said, you're going to go home, they meant it. And I meant they meant it. And that's when I finally, they shipped us to uh, uh, Holland. From Holland, we had to take a train to Hamburg. From Hamburg, I had to go further up, towards, up close to, not close, this far away from Denmark. That's where I was born. And nobody knew that I was coming. So uh, I got into a train where I always, when I went to work, I used that train all the time. And here I got off the train. And my aunt lives in that little town and I stopped there. She said, are you really home? I said, yep. I was listed as uh, what they call it. Yeah, missing in action. Yeah. My parents never got mailed, just that we were missing in action. Yeah, that was it. And I surprised them when I got home, and they couldn't believe it. We had to work for the brick, clean all the brick in Hamburg, but was bombed out. Then we could get the brick, but we wanted, but we had to make the same pile of brick for the city of Hamburg. And that's when a cousin of mine was a, a driver, a semi-driver. He brought the brick, and all of a sudden I surprised my parents. It was 1952. I said, well, I'm going back to the States. Oh, well, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I said, but you won't be surprised. Because we left a brand new house meant for us. My father and mother had another house. It was built in 1928. And this was built for my and my wife. And here we all of a sudden surprised them I said, you know what, because if you want to be a master in Germany, you try that. And I know guys that did try it, they never made it. When I come over here and I had, my, I had the two years done, I could do whatever I want to. In fact, I had work right away. And I use my prices, not what I heard, but they did. I came here because I could make it. And I showed all my relatives in no time. I had money, I had an account, because I hate to write. <laughs> the, uh, people we live with, somebody sent us over there, he was blind and she was limping and Mike's brother was about like this when we walked in to the door to find out if they rent that place out. This was in Hamburg. Oh, yeah. yeah. And 
our little boy said to her, Oma, they didn't want to rent it anymore. Since he said, Oma, she said, okay, you can move it tomorrow. Oma is grandmother in German. <laughs> <clears throat> People that don't know Dan. No. But, I mean, and, and we found out he was a millionaire, and so was she. So, and she, she lost her son, which was my age. And you know what? All of a sudden, you could say that I was her son. This is it. <laughs>